In our previous video on the animated sequences from the 1968 film The Charge of the Light Brigade, we were granted a lens into the Victorian era, how its people saw themselves and their places in the world. It was a glorious image filled to the brim with Whiggish triumphalism, but also a one of disquiet. There was something strange, something wrong with the images that we were being shown. There was a certain sense of animalistic barbarity floating so closely beneath the surface and just out of sight, which was constantly being hinted at. And now, in this our second video, we shall see these barbarities fully unleashed as Britannia marches to war. Our scene opens quickly, with a number of old men, likely warhawks and jingoistic politicians, rising quite literally out of the darkness. The Russians, the Russians, the Russians, they cry to us, as if the mere word is an argument all its own, the only thing that needs to be heard for us to justify war. Every hawk's cry spawns another of its sort, and soon the whole room is filled with the same cry. Quickly we flash to Victoria, flanked once again by her loyal Albert and two loving children. Tall ships pierce the heavens behind them, the wealth and lifeblood of the Empire, as the crowds heartily cheer them on. Ready, I ready, reads a banner behind them, some of the first actual color that we've seen in any of these skits. The message is clear, that Britannia stands ready to do her duty, and her people stand with her. The Warhawks again grow in number. The Russians, they remind the people. The Russians, they threaten. Now we see a very different conception of Britannia. Standing within the laurels of peace and victory, she holds her banner and her sword, a scowl across her face as she wears her helmet. The Lion of England stands beside her, meeting the eyes of its mistress. Britannia moves her sword aside, out of the Lion's path, her eyes dead set ahead. The Lion steps forward beyond the laurels. The time has come again to defend Britannia's honor, as it has done so many times in the past. Right against wrong, proclaims the scene, the only light in which Britannia could ever release her lion. Now drummers, richly clad in their baskins and musicians' coats, send out the call to arms as the army is raised. Appropriately enough, Britain's soldiers are portrayed as literal lions. With puffed-out chests and smiles on their face, they put on a proud show for their audience of a more gentle persuasion. The officer gives a twirl of his tail, here a comedic representation of an officer's scabbard as the men offer a salute. Most interestingly, the detail of the lion's legs, especially when considered with the young ladies observing them, emphasize the sexual and masculine traits of these Britannia's defenders. It's rather subdued here, I grant, but as we progress through these scenes, you'll notice that the sexual and gendered imagery becomes increasingly prominent. We come again to Victoria. Clad in her royal robes and with arms outstretched on her throne, she is the image of serenity. Remember, Victoria is Britannia, and Britannia is the guardian of progress. Now, for the first time, Her Majesty speaks. Poor little turkey, she exclaims in a commanding tone, referring to the victim of that most terrible Russian bear, and the moral mission of Britain to defend the weak. This cry is followed, however, with a most surreal image. All that remains of the queen is her head at the center of a disturbing collection of faces in the shape of that most blessed isle. Men and women, young and old, though all with disturbed countenances, their mouths twisted out of proportion, the people resemble mere puppets as they echo the cry, literally singing the same tune. Poor little turkey. The nation is unified, but under what pretense? And is Britannia truly guiding them in this action, as we've seen her do in earlier clips? Or is even Victoria's cry an act of puppetry? We return again to the same poor little turkey and the horrific, ravenous Russian bear chasing it down. Immediately the scene sets us on edge as a violent and clearly eastern-sounding theme plays in the background, and the heaving black mass of the Russian bear positions itself behind the smaller turkey. 
The sexual representation of this angle in particular is not without purpose, as the bear stamps its boot on the turkey's tail feathers, violently tearing away this image of the turkey's pride and beauty before casually discarding them and sweeping the naked and shamed bird into its arms, a twisted smile spreading across its face. And as the bear hungrily views his conquest, we see the miserable wretch, naked, beaten, and weak, transform into something wholly new. A beautiful woman, with long and flowing hair, wearing robes of pure white. This is the only human in our anthropomorphized portrayal, and she is clearly the classic damsel in distress. She isn't even Turkish, and while she's a far more dignified portrayal of this land than the previous one, nothing about her really represents Turkey itself, for which she is supposed to be standing in. While previously we saw the British image of Turkey, the poor, sick, little, innocent creature, now we see something else. Perhaps an image of justice or virtue, as an innocent virgin maid, left to the ravages of the brutish and beastly Russian bear. This attack on Turkey is far more than just a large country picking on a smaller one. Really, Turkey has very little to do with it at all. This is a rape of justice itself at the hands of the Eastern Menace. But what is this? The champion approaches. Immediately our music changes from the chaos of the East to the dignity of the West. As the bear shields his face and recoils in fear, hunched over and attempting to guard his conquest, the Lion of England strides authoritatively and directly towards him. Wearing the colors of his nation, he looks more like some patriotic boxer than a soldier as he raises his fists to the foe. Notice the stances of the two sides here. The bear keeping his arms close to his body, coveting his claim and snarling at the British lions as he leans as far away as he can. The lion, on the other hand, holds a firm and squared build, his feet planted firmly on the ground, displaying the brilliant colors of his banner, and his thick, muscular arms held up in perfect, ready angles. His face is one of dead-set determination, his head aligned confidently with his body. He's not hiding away from this job. He's ready for the match. We hear a bit of La Marseillaise, and our proud, stoic lion is joined by the eager French cock. The lion looks back to his friend, though never turns his fist away from the target. The French bird offers a salute to his much larger and imposing friend, eager to display whatever assistance may be required, though, given the look on our lion's face, it doesn't seem like much is expected from this friend. France may be the eager ally, and this is certainly admirable, but truly it is the British who will be doing the heavy lifting today. The bear begins to half-heartedly swipe at the air, trying to ward off the allied forces, but he's not willing to commit himself to the fight. He still hunches himself over his victim and keeps his arm close to his body in defense. The British lion, meanwhile, merely extends his position, ready to deal the knockout blow. And then he strikes. The lion's aim is true and straight, moving beyond the bear's cowardly claws directly to the brute's snout. The bear recoils and drops his victim. Rather than pursue the fight and crush the bear utterly in this moment of weakness, the lion takes note and immediately moves to cushion the woman's fall. As the bear swipes at his bloodied nose, oblivious to all but his own concerns, the lion gently takes the maid into his own heavy arms, a look of pity upon his face, and draws her back to safety. All the while, the French cock hops up and down in passionate excitement, like a child viewing their hero in action for the first time. As the enraged Russian bear finally recovers, the Lion of England again raises his arm in warning and defiance, the same stoic look upon his face. He doesn't want to hurt the bear again. He is merely holding it at bay, away from its victim. He is not like that rapine barbarian. He is not interested in suffering or revenge, only in justice and in truth. So he guards the maiden, as if to tell the bear, you shall not hurt her any more. But now, as the music swells with a glorious chorus, we again see a dramatic and grim change in tone. New figures begin to enter the screen. Six small bulldogs. They wear long coats and black top hats, as any gentleman of the day should, alongside patriotic Union flag vests. But unlike our lion, 
these British bulldogs don't have a look of temperance and stoic calm. Their maws are open in grotesque scowls, their eyes are hostile. And as our lion steps back away from the scene entirely, the dogs circle around the Russian bear, and we see something on the bear's face that we haven't seen before. Pure fear. Not anger, not hatred, or boiling passion which had him swipe away at his assailant, but the shock and confusion which leaves one completely unable to move. As the British lion looks onward, distant in his countenance, the bulldogs leap onto the bear. The orthodox giant screams out as the dogs tear at his flesh with teeth and claw, ripping holes through its hide as they devour the creature alive. The bear dances to and fro, desperate to shake off its attackers, but the onslaught, the horrific onslaught, continues. The bear's end is slow, violent, and gruesome as he collapses onto the ground, his crown rolling ingloriously astray, while the British bulldogs delight in its slaughter, staining their faces and claws with the cruer and gore of the creature's corpse, before looking in unison to the viewer with sickening and disturbed grins. This is what you wanted, wasn't it? they seem to say. You knew what war was. You knew it couldn't be so clean as punching the Russian in the nose and leaving. You knew the horror. You knew the barbarity, the mess of killing. Whether you admit it or not, these bulldogs accuse us. This is what you wanted. We look, perhaps in desperation, to our champion, to our courageous, proud, and honorable British lion, that which had been the symbol of England's armies up to this point. We look to him for aid. We thought that he would be the one involved. We'd never even seen, never heard of these dogs in black coats. We didn't know it would end in such terror. It was, this was meant to be an honorable affair. We look in desperation. And this is our reply. The lion knew what would happen. He never stained himself. And we never expected him to. But someone had to. That is the nature of warfare, of killing. To believe anything else, the lion seems to say to us, was a foolish and childish folly. We were tricking ourselves. This scene of terror, of horror, this is what we wanted. We wanted this. We return again to the home front. Protect the free, calls the fat judge from under his aristocratic wig and behind the safety of his quill. Defend the weak, exclaims the gouty-looking priest, holding up his holy text with deformed arms whilst the people look on. Empire threatened, the politician berates. Humanity imperiled, the gentleman yells. And across the streets, to every town, the cries grow to a deafening cacophony. War! It's on every man, woman, and child's lips. War! War! Around every pulpit, men eagerly exclaim their own view, echoing the same exact cry. War! Around their tables, leaders tear into the flesh of their meals, just like the bulldog to the bear. The pretension of table manners or honor long gone under this animalistic screeching for war. The emotions boil over as men are hopping and howling in the streets. Faces are overtaken by darkness and the insanity. The desperation of their screams for war are the only things that can be grasped. The savages begin to transform to a nature more true to their hearts. The noble, industrious, and proud Britons soon find themselves warped into ghostly abominations, twisted and corrupted by these cries. The horrific images grow and expand in intensity, chaos, and terror. This is killing. This is hatred. This is war. That most bestial of states which envelops in darkness all that's come across it. And at last the vote has finally come in. From the lips of every man the same cry echoes for war. And so Britannia shall send her sons away to fight to kill and to die, as she has done before and shall do again, as she must if she is to do her duty to defend the right against all such foreign tyrants and savagery. After all, like we said in our first video, who can better represent the right and all the divine Victorian virtues than those most noble Britons? 
And so we shall see the result of these cries to battle in our next video in the series. But until such a time, my dear viewer, I am and I shall remain your most humble and obedient of servants.